You know, I love the the self growth development movements, but I think one thing that's continuously like lacking is if you want to grow, the first step is not integration. The first step is disintegration. You can't stay the same and change at the same time. It doesn't work, right? But we are only like we're so untrained in subtleties that we have to have big breaks to be like, oh my god, I'm changing. I'm disintegrating. But what if we develop this way in which we're much more able to perceive subtleties? So I can have an interaction with Michael over coffee, and he says something that I'm like, "Wow, that thing made me feel something." What if happens if I stay and keep pulling on that thread? And I think that's what changes people. That's that's such a valuable tool. If you want to get to soul, you want to get to soul. Learn to be subtle. Learn to sit and listen. You know, go to nature, but sit down and listen. Just listen. Welcome back to the transmission. Hope you are stupendous, and if not, hopefully uh, this helps perk up your wonder whiskers a little bit. And if I may be so bold, I'm going to say that it will, because we've got the soothing, soulful, wise Dr. Ido Cohen back in the mind meld. Uh, but he may be a new guest. For those of you just joining or finding us on the YouTube, quick plug, we do have over 300 mind melds available wherever you listen to podcasts. So do dive in, do explore. Uh, Like I mentioned, we've got several with Dr. Ido Cohen. But anyway, he has established himself as a true wonder brother, a true regular, because his worldview, I think, is so badly needed and really overlaps and resonates with my own. He's got this mythopoetic, soulful way of making sense of the human condition and the psyche in general and this larger meaning crisis we're all grappling with. He, like me, is heavily influenced by Carl Jung, ancient wisdom, myth, and it all just culminates in a wise, soothing presence uh, that always leaves me feeling uh, conversationally caressed. In this one, we muse a lot about nourishing the relationship with your inner world, exploring and making sense of the deeper layers of your psyche that often get ignored and many times we don't even know they exist, living this outward-facing, rat race, hamster wheel life. We also get into modern masculinity, the explosive phenomenon of Andrew Tate, probably from angles you've never considered or heard about before. And of course, that very same meaning crisis that we're all grappling with that I just mentioned, because uh, I just can't help myself from talking about it. Do give Dr. Ido Cohen a follow on the socials. Links for that and everything else, Ido, are in the description. Uh, And before we go any further, I must do the obligatory appeal for your altruistic clicks here on YouTube. Uh, That means please like and sub. Comments and shares are appreciated as well. All of the above help increase the circumference of our psychic splash here on YouTube, uh, which admittedly is pretty small right now. Also, a tsunami of psychic smooches to the roughly 150 of you supporting these transmissions on Patreon, If you're not aware, uh, we've got all kinds of patron-only phenomena happening. In fact, we just did a patron-only wonder dip with Dr. Ido Cohen last night. And actually, every month we do what I call a wonder gym hang featuring a guest you've heard on the show. You also get rewards like stickers, pins, shirts, and more, uh, including this pin. My camera's reversed, so this is confusing as fuck. This pin right here. We've also got a patron-only Discord server, a book club, and a bunch of other stuff. Do consider joining. Other keyboard mudras for our website and latest sponsor are also in the description. And with that, let's meld minds with my wonderful, whimsical friend, Dr. Ido Cohen. It is always a pleasure to meld minds with you, man. You are one of my favorite, just like, soul-centered psychologists. Mm. And I've met several i've done podcasts with several over the years but you might be the you and miles neal do you know miles neal yeah i, I was think just you listening two. to your youtube's bounce oh perfect yeah 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 
I think you two are probably the most re- returningest guests in that vein, but you're both unique in many ways as well. Mm. And just a like, just a very kind of important distinction, I think. You know, people hear psychology, and I think they think a lot of different things because psychology is not one thing. I mean, you can be academic, analytical hardcore data-driven uh, type of psychologist, or you can be this like soul-centered psychologist, this, this, this psyche, mythopoetic-based person. And, and mm-hmm. obviously, everyone who knows you knows that's what you are. But how did you make the decision to, to fully mm-hmm. lean into that direction, you know, versus go like the more traditional route? First of all, you're very generous. Uh, thank you. And it's really good to be here again. Um, Thanks, I always love melting with you. I talk about, yeah, about your podcast a lot with my people. Um, okay, this is going to sound like a cliche, but I don't think it was a choice. Um, I really think it was more of a conclusion of observations. Um, I remember studying psychology and sociology in undergrad, which was a great fuse for like in a great marriage for me. Um, And it was just clear to me. I was like, you cannot really treat someone. You can't create real change if you're not going to work on the level of soul. You can do behavioral changes, you can do cognitive changes, you can help emotion regulation, understand feelings better, and that will give you a better life. But if we're talking about true, like true, in my mind, fulfillment, depth, happiness, love, it has to go into the level of soul. Um, And if you truly want to have a deeper relationship with your external reality, it has to be at the level of soul. Right. For me, if I want to go to nature and really, really kind of enjoy and be immersed in nature, it doesn't talk to my psychology. It doesn't talk to my feelings. That's just the first layer of connection. But deep, deep, deep underneath, it does something on a much deeper level. It just doesn't regulate my somatic system. Again, that's just the more conscious, right? The thing that our ego is more conscious of. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So for me, I was just following my observations. I was like, okay, I need to find a system that acknowledges all of it, somatic, psychological, emotional, and the soul spiritual. Because uh, for me, it's only when you take treat all those four dimensions, you really create transformation. You already said the magic <laughs> word, my friend. We were just talking about conceiving of your life in, in these different dimensions before we were mm. recording. And I had sort of a light bulb moment epiphany there because... I think we all sense that. I think people all sense at least a kind of dualism within themselves, like that there's this outward, egoic, projecting, professional, not not even necessarily just professional, but just the outward appearance of who you are, the persona of who, who you are, and then what you perceive to be the true inside version of you, your emotional life, your psychic life, your whatever words nomenclature you want to put on that but we are hyper obsessed culturally with that outward appearance and all of the metrics the bank account the looks all of the appearances and the inward really there is no priority at least not a priority that will be thrust upon you by the world it's all you're it's all incumbent upon you to take that dimension seriously to develop it to probably understand that there's a lot more than one dimension within that inner dimension and it's really sad to me how little emphasis there is put on that dimension and taking it Mm. seriously and developing it and watering it and giving it the nutrients it needs to a point where i don't even think we have a language, a system, a modality, or at least most people don't to to deal with that world, to take that world even seriously. So I'm sure when people come to you, you just see them starved of like recognition of that world and all of those things I just mentioned. 
But how do you conceive of it for you? Because I know you just said you had like a powerful experience that you do for yourself yourself that you do these kind of Mm -hmm. these resets periodically these retreats periodically where you just go deep within yourself investigate these dimensions conceive Mm -hmm. of these dimensions look at what you're doing and not doing so so how do you conceive of it and how do you serve that dimension for yourself so you were already triggering for me like right Jung talked about it like personality one and personality two. yeah Right? Mm-hmm. There is two personalities in every person. There is the necessary persona, right, which is the bridge between the self and the world that we need. It's not a bad thing. I think that's where persona maybe gets a bad rap. It's like, oh, your persona. It's like, yeah, your persona is a bridge. But it's a way to connect to the world. And the problem is, is when you get too identified with your persona, that you start thinking that that's who you are, or you start truly believing. And I, I love the word identification that that's who you are. Mm-hmm. Right. So I can give you an example. I was just telling you that I do this yearly retreat that I go alone. And I, when I did it this December, it took me a day. I could feel the doing part of me, that part of me that needs to function within a society and a system that needs to, I need to create money. I need to create content. I need to create knowledge. I need to create a certain type of self in order to not just survive, but like accomplish thing and feel fulfilled in my life. And it took that part of me a day and a half to relax. And I had to continuously say like, there's nothing to do. I don't have to, to produce anything right now. It's okay to just sit in a hot tub, you know, under the redwoods and enjoy my privilege and let my body relax. And it took me a day and a half. And then something else kind of relaxed. And then I could start tapping into something more. Right. And he talks about that as personality too. That's your soul. That's where you really experience your or the deeper layer of who you truly are. And I think it's a real struggle, right? Gabor Mate talks about it a lot in his new book, The Myth of Normal, right? We all live in the myth of normal. And we develop we develop a personality that's its entire job is to cope with what normality should be like, right? So what my parents tell me normal is, what society tell me normal is, what my gender or what society perceives as my gender tell me what's normal is. And we build a whole personality around it. And then you get depressed or you have panic attacks or you have a psychedelic experience or you (laughs) go through an accident or a near death like experience or something and something inside goes, it's, I think the initial feeling is like a break. There is a break inside and it feels horrible, right? And then how do you, are you able to, our task is to sit with that break and be like, wait, what, why, why am I experiencing this? Yeah. Right. Let alone we live, we idealize the successful and the glamorous and we don't see their breaks. We just see that, that we just see personality one. And we all strive yeah. to become their personality one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Who was it that just uh, that beautiful dancer, Twitch? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, man. Right? That's just a great recently. example. Yeah, that's a great example. And, and I would, I would love to ask you about that. So for people that aren't aware, this guy essentially reached the peak of what you're ever going to accomplish as a dancer. Like he totally transcended that millions of followers, wealthy, married children was like Ellen's DJ. Yeah. All these things always seemed, you know, like he was just beaming and like lighting up the room and he killed himself and, and everyone was just shocked. Shocked. Exactly. And it was, you know, there was some, I want to say I was, I was at my mom's when this happened and she, you know, she's very plugged into what's going on. Um, you know, she'll, she likes to gossip. We'll leave it at that. But, <laughs> um, so, you know, she's speculating and was telling me that there was some allusion to like past demons or something. But the larger question that I think perplexes a lot of people and, you know, I've grappled with too, is when people look outwardly successful and then they do something like that, they're just like suddenly kill themselves. How do you, as a psychologist, make sense of that? Like, like, how do you mm. make sense of this chasm 
between that outward appearance and whatever they were going through that was so terrible that they just had to hit the off button and be like, I just can't even live anymore. I can't even, you know, there's nothing aside that I can imagine that would make me want to keep living like that. That is a huge chasm for for the person, for the onlooker <laughs> trying to make sense of that. I think it's their the. I think we can see it a few ways. I think it's some kind of intense disconnect between personality one and personality two. Yeah. Right. You can invest. I had a professor at CIS who told me once that he hosted a Buddhist monk in his house. And he's like, he was a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was the rudest person, very not likable very entitled and he said wow. you know some people grow spiritually but they don't grow in other ways so i think if you grow your personality one if you invest all your time growing in your personality one right your persona am i being loved am i successful do i have the car do i have the the the, the pretty partner do i have all these things and you don't listen to the connection between those personality one personality two that's going to create tension right i mean freud said that's what depression is it's the lack of investment in that, the parts in your feelings, in your drives, in your impulses, right? So I think for him, I don't know, I don't want to assume, but I want to assume that it was, what caught me is the same thing that caught you. I was like, wow, nobody knew. Yeah. Right? He wasn't even able to tell anyone that he was suffering. How come? So the question for me is like, how do you get to that point? Yeah. How do you get to that point that you can't share your suffering with people? And then that inner conflict is unbearable. You can't tolerate the suffering alone anymore. That, you know, that could be one of those masculine holdovers mm -hmm. from old generations, you know, yeah. that men are just not, they're innately wired almost to just not share their suffering, to let their suffering be known. Like they would, they would rather shoulder the suffering in silence than ever open up. And, and I have no idea if that is what he was going through or not. But I mean, I certainly know men in my own family who, who operate that way. I certainly know sure. other men who operate in that way. And, you know, as unpopular as it is these days to like, empathize with the masculine or empathize whatever like we're gonna real, do it it's a real burden it is a real burden that you know men are trying to balance and make sense of like there are I, I think by and large we're becoming much more open i think our generation and younger are again by and large much quicker to hug much quicker to open up much quicker to like tell their friends that they love them etc but that but it's it's still there it's still there you know and some of that's healthy too it's weird because it's not you know it's not mutually exclusive i don't think i think no. there's some amount of it that is healthy that that is i think that does lead to a life of you know it contributes to drive it contributes to grit and like these are things you want but then there's there's shadow sides. I think that's yes. maybe the best way to put it. Can I, can I put you on the spot for a second? Of course. When is the last time you shared with another male friend of yours your true... You talked in your last podcast about two types of suffering. When is the last time you shared with a male friend your true suffering, Michael? Like your true, true pains of your existence? That's a good question. You know, I don't, I don't feel like I, I really cl like cloister that fully, but I also have this feeling of like, no, nah, not, now's not really the time to get into this. You know, it's like, e even with my good friends, when I'm talking to them, I, rarely am I just like, I want to like unleash this burden on someone, you know? So, okay. You I, see that word though? Yeah. Yeah. It's a burden. That's what men have learned, that their feelings, their deep experiences, it's a burden. They're not supposed to burden people. That's masculine trauma. Mm -hmm. 
I can share. I was in a, I had a friend visiting here from Israel who him, myself, and another person who also lives in California, we known each other for 20 something years. We lived together in multiple places. We traveled in Asia together, very close relationship. And we had this topic come up and I asked him, I was like, be honest, when you were a teenager, did you ever share with your male friends how you truly feel? And they both said no. So these are, right, we are, this is the phenomena or symptom of masculinity. Now, we talked about someone that, <laughs> this is might going to get interesting for people who are listening. Let's talk about Andrew Tate, right? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. here's this controversial man who erupted like a volcano into the social sphere. Yeah. And I told you, he was the most Googled thing in 2022. I'm talking like hundreds of billions of Google searches let alone how many views he had on TikTok and all this stuff, right? And he's presenting a very particular type of masculinity. What is happening in the collective unconscious that this yeah. phenomena is so intensely grabbing yeah. everybody's attention? He's everywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is happening? Who is he, right? Now, mind you, I want to say, I am not an Andrew Tate fan. <laughs> I, don't, I think... 99% of his messages are wrapped in toxicity and are not helpful for anyone. And inside all that toxicity, he does bring something, which I think we're naming is like, men have learned, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? That if they're not killers, they don't exist. Yeah. So he's talking to that wound and he's like, okay, if that's the reality, I'm going to teach you how to become a killer. I'm going to teach you how to make a lot of money. I'm going to teach you how to get the woman. I'm going to teach you all these things. And he's talking directly yeah. to that wound. And he's able to grab all these men who are, let's go, are suffering deep inside from that exactly. They're like, yeah, finally someone sees me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're but it definitely, but yeah. it's negating, sorry to, but it's right. It's, no. This negates all the shadow that's wrapped up in all his messages, which is. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna. It's gonna be interesting to see how we deal with the aftermath of this of this movement in like two or three years, as opposed to what's happening right now. Yeah, and you know, th this is a phenomenon that I just think, even outside of him in particular, I want to talk a little bit more about him in particular. But yeah. outside of him in particular, this is an interesting phenomenon where cults form around certain personalities and sometimes it's for the good sometimes it's for the evil sometimes it's for the neutral sometimes it's in between right. but it's almost like you can guarantee if someone reaches this manic level of success where people are just mm -hmm. fomoing into them like it's some kind of fucking you know cryptocurrency that's just won't stop <laughs> skyrocketing it's like it's like it's like bull it's like bullish fomo behavior like that that's what right. it is it's like you see mm -hmm. people glomming on to a particular personality i think that i think that that is a surefire sign of what you're alluding to that there is something in the collective unconscious that mm -hmm. this is becoming a vessel for now like yes, this is exactly. not about this person anymore. Now this person is like collecting a kind of energy somehow and everyone's attracted to it because they're becoming like an archetype of something. And I think what that mm -hmm. archetype of something is, is like, it's a little bit of like Mars energy. Maybe it's a little bit of like conquering Zeus archetype energy or something like that. And it makes sense because people are starved for that kind of energy, I think, because there's just there. It's so multifaceted. I don't think it's a simple answer. You know, you, you could go hyper simple with it and say men can't be men anymore. You know, you could go down that whole rabbit hole, like the pro the pro male, like I'm a fucking man and I'm not sorry about it. You could go down that <laughs> rabbit hole. But but it's more than that. I, I think it's also just people don't have catharsis. People don't mm. have catharsis for you know, they don't have sexual outlets. They don't have physical outlets. They don't have like some great cause worth dying for in their life. So they project all of that. Like he becomes a vessel for all of that. And they see him as a path toward that somehow. And I've seen it happen with other people too. Like, I, you know, people, you know, and I think he's a way less evil 
and I don't even want to say Andrew Tate's evil because I don't know how much of the things he's accused of are true. I don't know how much of what he says he really believes. It's right. like, I, I just don't know. I just, I don't know. But yeah, from the outside looking in, it does look pretty toxic or or at the very least, it, it looks like to me that- But not he, necessarily untrue, by the way. Just yeah, because it's toxic, true. it doesn't mean that there's not a lot yeah. of like That's truth in, the, in that toxicity. That's a great point. And but I am uh, curious about what you said about catharsis. You yeah, because yeah, if you can say something more, because this is interesting to me. Because I've been in the army, I've had catharsis. Yeah, I've been enlisted into. I can tell you that doesn't give you anything. That did not fulfill any masculine, archetypal, primal masculine need for me. On contrary. It just added to the complexity, unless you stay in a militant like state of mind. Mm -hmm. You know, this is where it's interesting. I can see, and obviously there's many reasons for the difference, but in Israel, you have to go to the army. Yeah. You go, you do your three years. Very rarely people stay like have this like military pride after. Mm -hmm. In the US, it's a lot more of a phenomenon. People build a personality around it. You are like, you're a vet. And I, maybe that talks to this catharsis. Maybe this talk, and maybe you're talking about purpose. It's like, how do you create yeah. a sense of purpose in a life that if you don't have a sense of purpose, you are going to be like a leaf in a river, you know, you're going to go. Yeah, but I'm, because I, I, yeah, there's so many responses. I, I love the yeah. archetype idea. I think he's, honestly, I think he's a genius in the sense that he could sess out what what's the necessary archetype and mm -hmm, he just like mm -hmm. took it from the collective air and just like yeah he's like okay i'm gonna be your <laughs> hyper car badass right messiah yeah. savior yeah like well, he just he isn't afraid to turn up the dial on the exact car car cartoonish levels of everything and, and another thing that i think he does probably somewhat knowingly is he plays with controversy and this is the other, like, this is just something that sure. I, I felt the pull to try to like be a lightning rod at times, or I felt the pull to be controversial at times. And clearly this works for him. Clearly this works for people like Jordan Peterson. Clearly like they're sort of masters of like pushing certain buttons. And I just cannot bring myself to do that. Like, I just don't think it's genuine and I don't think it attracts the right kind of attention. Like I think the kind of attention it draws stems from a kind of like anger, you know, like mm. you can't, you can't be attracted to that unless you feel like that anger, you've bottled that anger up and now you have this outlet to like almost vicariously live through that person's statements. And, 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 you know, mm. some people might just think it's trolling. Some people might just think it's funny, but then there's like a core group of people who are totally drunk the Kool-Aid and it's like, that's where, that's where I have the issue with it. Because I personally don't like, if you think it's funny, if you think it's entertaining and at the end of the day, you're like, yeah, I don't really feel that way, but I just think it's crazy to watch people cringe. You get super angry. Like a part of me gets that. Cause there's a scurrilous trickster, you know, fucking type of person in me too and and i want to push buttons sometimes and privately with my friends i'll you know of course we'll fuck with sure. each other and i'll you know whatever but when but you but when you know you're pushing on like real people's pain for clicks that seems like you've done a bit of a deal with the devil to me you know mm. I I agree with you. I agree with you. But I, again, maybe it's just because of who I am. I'm more interested in the phenomena. Mm -hmm. I'm as interested of the in the act and then phenomena. First, yeah. I think that everyone, that all these people that you mentioned, Jordan Peterson, him, we can think of a few, right? Jung says that if you are going to identify with an, no one person can embody an archetype. You can yeah. do it for sure. It spurts. But if you're going to let it like really take over, you're going to be possessed. And yeah. the moment you're possessed, you then are dealing with totally different set of consequences, right? I mean, let's look at what 
I mean, let's we're staying with Andrew Tate. Where is he right now? Yeah, you right. choose to yeah. take it on. Yeah. There is going to be serious consequences, right? Because yep. you're not just dealing with like interpersonal dynamics. You're like expanding to deal with the whole of the collective unconscious, and that's out of your control. You don't know what's going to happen, and there are forces in the world that are right invested in keeping things a certain way right now, or keeping things a certain in a certain order. So you're going against that. And so that's one. Two, I'm like, yeah, but if you think about it, he, the phenomena, what is, how is it that someone, just by using words, right? Yeah, so he has the Bugatti and he, so many people have, you know, a lot of people have Bugattis and Lamborghinis and like all this and more money than him and more accolades than him. But what is happening that he was able to find that one nerve? Yeah. That, like that's triggering the whole world. Mm -hmm. That's more interesting to me because that means something about us as a, as a collective, right? That he's talking to. And it's not just men, it's also women. There's a lot of women who are into this philosophy. They're like, yes, I want the man who's gonna, mm -hmm. I wanna come back to this way of interpersonal relationship where I'm being taken care of and this and that and blah, 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 whatever that is, right? Or what they call today like the red pill. Right, I want to join. I want to like embody the red pill movement. So, what is happening? What is happening in the world that that's such a yeah fertile ground for all these reactions for all these? And that's a great. I think it has to do with what you said last on your last podcast. You know, there's. Let's go back to soul. There's, I I love this idea that there is two types of suffering. There is what Freud called neurotic suffering, which is the suffering where you just keep repeating the same thing you're like oh i'm so miserable look at this thing is happening for me nothing is changing oh i'm so miserable keep right and then there is authentic suffering and authentic suffering as i understand it comes back to what you're saying which is you have to deal with your soul yeah yeah if you're a millionaire and you are unhappy when you go to bed at night you have to deal with that not by buying another car not by drinking another bottle, not by doing this or that or the other, by actually going deep down inside. You know, it, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's this whole thing about um, Prince Harry and how he used ayahuasca and psilocybin. And it always see. baffles me. Like, why are people surprised? This is yeah. what happened. Like, that's what we were saying. This is what happens behind the screen of, the, of personality number one. These people are suffering. We're all suffering. Yeah. Right? Yeah, but I think I think if there, there's an urge to make sense of your circumstance, your incarnation, why you popped into this particular protein suit, regardless <laughs> of if you popped into one that has is is suffering, has very little, is abused, or anything in between on any part of the spectrum. And I'm sure for him you've got to feel a kind of like, why am I a prince? Why, why did I, why am I here? What is this? You know, what, like, what the fuck is going on? What's the, what's the mm. deeper truth? And I think, I think there are some people who just lack the seeking impulse and they're okay to go through the motions and they're okay to just travel the right hand path and the straight and narrow and the bigger questions just aren't compelling enough for them to really dedicate much chi to it you know just mm. like they're like eh, whatever like and but for everybody else i i think it spans the gamut of of life circumstance i think people behind the veneer are just like what the fuck is going on like i know it feels like there's more it feels like there's something i'm not getting and and i don't know if that malaise that like dukkha as buddhists would call it that just kind of mm. general sense of something's not right i'm this kind of low level simmering of suffering and discontent that we all carry with us or at least people who have this seeking impulse i think carry with them uh, it's just there and and i and i go back and forth on if i think there's really an answer to that like if i think there really is a way to quell that or if it's just like no that's endemic like that's just will always be there. And and I think it can be I think it can be worse. I think it can probably be better, 
but I don't know if it's something you can actually exercise yourself of. Even if you're a prince, you know, it's like, clearly you're a prince. Like what you literally are like the top zero, 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 one percent of, of famous <laughs> humans. And you're, you're, you're of human searching. experience yeah. of human experiences. Yeah. I mean, who gets to be a prince at this day and age, you know, like yeah. you're, I, I think I, I love what you're saying, but I, I, I'm, I think, I think we have too much access to, to information. Yeah. I think right now to truly stay unconscious to your soulful life is a, is a, is a choice. It's not about access anymore. Everybody, almost every person in this world, almost not all has access to some kind of service online or not that's going to give them access to the idea that there's a lot more than what you're living. Right. You can, if you know how to utilize Google and you have, you can access the most esoteric, change your life tomorrow knowledge today, right now. Yeah. You can sit yeah. and plug yourself. You know, it's like that. Um, it was a movie with Keanu Reeves where, you're, not The Matrix, but an, where basically you could just, he would just upload all these like libraries of stuff into his brain. And it's like, like you had a hard drive in your mind. Anyway, Not the matrix? No, no, no. There was something else. Hmm. I'll, I'll find it. But he definitely did that. So let's use the matrix, too, right? It's yeah. in the matrix, right? It's the same thing, right? So there's a part of me that's like, I don't know. I haven't met any person that I've worked with that wasn't aware that there is more. Yeah. It was always just like, listen, yes, there is more, but I got to figure out how to make a living. Yeah. Yes, there is more, but I got to parent my children. Or yes, there is more, but my parents taught me, like I was forced religion in such a way that made me be so aversive to anything spiritual that I don't want to even touch that because I associate that with my religious wound. Yeah. So maybe I'm an optimist in that way, but I don't think so. Any, I think it's really about choice we have so much access and yep. i think it's also something that has to do and maybe this is where you know early childhood development comes in play which is how much strength you have mm. right can you because it's you know i love the 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 mood like the self-growth development movement um but I think one thing that's continuously like lacking is if you want to grow, the first step is not integration. The first step is disintegration. I'm sorry. Maybe people would disagree with me, but that's totally fine. I've just seen it. The first step, if you want to change, you first have to disintegrate. You can't stay the same and change at the same time. That doesn't work. Right? But we are only like, we're so untrained in subtleties that we have to have big breaks to be like, Oh my God, I'm changing. I'm disintegrating. now. You're totally. always the right. But what if we develop this way in which we're much more able to perceive subtleties so I can have an interaction with Michael over coffee. And he said something that I'm like, wow, that thing made me feel something. What if happens if I stay and keep pulling on that thread? Yeah. And I think that's what changes people. Or that's a tool I was just talking about it with my friends. That's that's such a valuable tool. If you mm -hmm. want to get to soul, you want to get to soul. Learn to be subtle. Learn to sit and listen. You 100%. know, go to nature, but sit down and listen. Just listen. Oh yeah, yeah. but I usually and I hear this so often. Oh yeah, but all I hear is my mind like rambling, like the monkey mind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and who even does that, man? Like, I mean, I think it's like pulling teeth to try to get people to meditate for 10 minutes a day, to get yourself to meditate for 10 minutes a day. And it's ridiculous because silence, I, I see your beautiful little pupper looking yeah, in back she, there. She has She's a, so a little cute. bit of uh... door neuroticism. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I get it. Golden's backing they're, up now. They're, they're, do they're, they're people dogs, man. Um. <laughs> Yeah, my mom has a golden. She, he's the I best. know, I know he's you guys best. have a... Um, but yeah, I was just thinking about this yesterday. Like I wrote down a thought that wasn't quite clean enough to, to post on the internets, but it was close. 
And it was something to the effect of just like, silence is literally the most basic dimension of self of mm. that of that personality too that we're talking about that inner life and we don't visit it and we we increasingly don't visit it because there's just everything demanding our attention and trying to flirt with our dopamine at all times you know it's like you could put i got some dopamine for you here i got like literally we're surrounded by like drug dealers of dopamine at all times and and we're just selecting <laughs> but you like, know who's the biggest pusher this yeah 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 yeah. you would become the biggest right we don't do that i love what you're saying but we don't do that because we're terrified of that voice inside our heads with just us that's personality one yeah in my mind we're just terrified of sitting in our skin and and i'm curious what do you think michael but how much do you think of yes it's silence Right. And then there is what silence brings its perception. There is this story. Mm -hmm. I just heard this story. It's a Kabbalistic story. This man goes to uh, a class with a rabbi and has an almost has an accident on the way. And he comes to the rabbi and he's like, Oh my God, Rabbi, you have to hear this. I just had the biggest miracle happen to me. He's like, Oh, great. What happened? He's like, I was driving on the road and I almost got hit. I'm telling you, if I would get hit, I would die. And he's like, wow, you know, thank God. What a blessing. And he's like, you know, that's so funny. I also had an amazing miracle come, like coming here today. He's like, yeah, what happened to you? He's like, nothing. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, I guess I'm curious for you. What is the, right? When you sit in silence, you meet your perception. Right. What is the silence just for me, at least, like really amps up how you live your how you live in perception. Do you yeah. live with that drug? Like you're saying, like, oh, am yeah. I this junkie? Oh, yeah. That's what I'm perceiving. No, oh I don't God, need to I'm ask. Junkie. I don't need to ask myself. I am a junkie. I am a junkie. <laughs> like I was telling you, I'm I'm on the cusp of doing kind of like a big personal reset right now because I know mm -hmm. I'm a fucking junkie when it comes to these things. And it exercises or it demands a giant toll on, mm. uh, on your libido, you know, not, not your sexual libido, but on your ability to be potent in life with your life energy, like e just executing your life energy in a mindful way. These things are just like parasites on your ability to be a potent human being and at some point you've got to get it under control and i think people don't necessarily have that direct thought when it comes to something like mm. quieting down being introspective going into meditation but th but it's like they're afraid in the same way you'd be afraid to like look underneath a rug you haven't cleaned in a, in a long time i think they're afraid to, to be like, oh, I, like, I don't want to let it actually settle and come to the surface in a way where I just have to be with it. You know, I want to continue to distract myself from it. I want to continue to anesthetize myself to it with that dopamine, with the entertainment, with the distractions, and not have to deal with it. But in the same way, I find that putting off something stupid, like I was just, I just think I said this recently, like I was late in my car registration. And just dealing with it is never as hard as you make it in your mind or like doing your taxes or paying a bill or whatever the it fuck just it is. It just happened to me too, by the way. I just missed my card. Just, just right. So yeah. Yeah. Cause it's just like, uh, you know, it's just like some, it's some little thorn you don't want to deal with. And it's like, you know, the sooner you pull it out, the sooner it's just going to start healing and you don't have to deal with it anymore. You can move on to the next thing. And that's, that's something that I have dealt with my entire life being a procrastinator but um what do you think that is for you what, what I was is just that saw, force behind yeah. so i just recorded a pod that isn't out yet with my friend colin and um we talked about this too and i do think to an extent it's not only an avoid like an avoidant behavior but it, it sort of comes from this place of fear deep down and it's a fear that stems from sort of like if i if i deal with all of these things i no longer have an excuse all my excuses are gone 
And if I don't have any excuses and I still am not like where I perceive like I should be or, mm. or think I deserve to be or whatever it is, then it's like, it's just, there's something wrong with me now and there's no excuse anymore. I've dealt with all the excuses and now it's just me that has failed or some, or something that to, to that effect. Um, but a lot of the time too, it might, it may just be laziness or, or choosing to, to do other things. And it may not be that, that epic of a, you know, <laughs> no, I, I, I'm with you. I, I, I think it has, I, I'm with you. I think it has to do with fear, but I don't know, just the way you said it is so powerful. It's fear, but it's also self-acceptance, right? So what if yeah. I've had no excuses and, oh, oh my God, look, six months and I'm not a rich millionaire and, you know, like have a successful YouTube channel and blah, 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 or full clinic and I'm not like published and self-recognized. Um, and what is that? So what if I'm not, again, right? So here's personality two or personality one. What if I'm not going to become what I think I should become? Right? That's, I think for me, that's the deeper experience. And I think we're, yeah. I don't know, for me, it's shame. Yeah, definitely. That's in there too. But, in there too. but even in that, it's like, where's this come? Why should I be ashamed that I'm on my way to becoming something? Where's that? Yeah. From? And then, and then there's another level of shame behind that because it's like, well, what if you're not on your way? What if this is as good as it gets? And from here, it just so gets what if? worse. Yeah, yeah. So what if? Well, I no, think, I'm, I'm seriously asking. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I think there is something deep in there. So what I if, if you know, it's like. Well, I think I want to be. I want to think that I'm a special, you know, like yeah. snowflake in the universe, like that I'm a special particle a when anyone, I when I am. Yeah. In my own personal way, right? I but how anyone, much of that is again perception and construct? Yeah, I think anyone who says that they don't want to be is full of shit i think everybody to an extent <laughs> wants to be recognized wants to be loved wants to achieve accolades and, and i'm tempted to say i don't think there's anything wrong with that but there might be I, i'm not sure if there's anything wrong with that but i think we should just let that lie and like admit that we all want that we all want to be appreciated we all want to be successful we all want to grow we all want to do better and whether or okay, not you're you're a fun. Hillman fan, right? Of course, yeah. You love, okay, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. where how does where does this leave room for all that being ego and not really soul? That soul has its purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. you read Soul's Code mm -hmm. many times, right? Yeah. The the daemon the daemon already knows who you're gonna become. You think you should become someone. Yeah. But your soul is like, no, you're not going to become a multi-billionaire, successful entrepreneur. You're actually going to become a beautiful gardener who's going to make beautiful gardens for people. And you're going to make them really happy. And you know what the, the scary thing to me is, too, that I think one of the implications of that sort of Greek myth, if you want to take it seriously, this idea that we all come into the world with this sort of preordained destiny, um, and for people who don't know what we're talking about, that you must not have ever listened to my podcast before. But it's there, so it's from James Hillman. He's a psychologist who's very, you know, young adjacent and influenced by Jung's analytical psychology. And but he he developed kind of his own offshoot of that called archetypal psychology. I, I don't know if he's the founder of that, but I know he's at least. I think the, so. Yeah, I think he's the founder of it. So he has a book called Soul's Code, and it's all about kind of remixing this idea of your life does have a purpose. You did come into the world with a calling, with a destiny, and the Greeks, the Romans, and many different cultures believed that the keeper of that destiny was your daimon or your genius. And I, I But I think the deeper implications of that myth are that not every destiny is a good one. You know, there's people who are, I think, brought into the world with a tragic destiny. Yeah. And that's that's a hard pill to swallow because we can't understand it. We can't understand the underlying transcendent forces and patterns 
that lend itself to that destiny crafting process. Mm -hmm. Like it's probably kind of similar to karma where there's like a momentum where there's exactly. other things. There's like, I don't know, soul weather or something at the time of your conception. <laughs> conception. And that, mm -hmm. that influences everything. And I don't, and it sounds incredibly defeatist to say that you have no ability to avoid your destiny. But I think the most charitable reading of it would be that who cares if it's, if your, if your destiny is tragic, like go through, still go through, it's better to go through the process dancing. It's better to go through the process, like lightly and enjoying in a sort of Alan Watts kind of way. You know, mm -hmm. than it is to be like, oh, I'm tragic. Everything sucks. I'm not a billionaire. Wah, you know, <laughs> and and I try I try to definitely, you know, if I'm ever feeling sorry for myself or whatever, I do try to maintain that perspective. Sure. But it's it's not easy. It's definitely not. No, easy. To do. No, no, no. It's not easy at all. It's not easy at all, especially when, you know, we're surrounded by mirrors of everybody's personality one and you just see everybody's happiness perceived yeah. happiness or mm -hmm. pseudo happiness and success and everybody's good but you know you're making me think of like club 27 look at his mm -hmm. club of people who had the tragic um jimmie hendrix jim morrison oh, yeah, yeah. um what's her I name didn't kurt, kurt uh, amy cobain winehouse too. kurt cobain right all these like they had a tragic destiny but look at the impact yeah look at how they shaped so many people's lives so is it tragic tragic in one perception right. That's a great point because we're so death -phobic, And who says, you know? yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. Thank you for saying that, right? And who, who, how did we get to the fact that that's tragic as though we're all supposed to live until we're 90 right? and, you know, or die old and gray and happy, surrounded by X amount of people and this and that, which I wish for everybody, by the way. Um, but yes, I'm curious how you think it has to do with being death -phobic. Because I'm totally with you. I think it has to do with death yeah. and endings I and mean, perceived what's perceived happiness. Yeah. I, I mean, if someone truly lives the way they want to live and it cuts their life short, I think it is debatable if that's tragic, right? Because it's like, no, they did exactly what they said they were going to do. And yeah, they died younger than you want to die or, or whatever. But maybe that's not tragic. To me, I, I, I'm still totally openly afraid of it i'm still totally openly like not ready to cross that threshold i feel like i have many many things no. i want to do and you know recently i have seen how beautiful it is to to live a long life and to you know see what it's like when a hundred year old, year old man is just surrounded by generations of people mm -hmm. and has you know that would not literally would not exist if not for him like i think i mentioned i had a, a grandfather who lived to, to be 100 out in the bay area and like those gatherings we would have for his birthdays were just insane man because i would i would think mm. like there'd be these psychedelic moments where the whole family gets together so it's all of his kids and their kids and in some cases their kids kids wow. so you just have like this generations room. on generations yeah like this room filled with people that are actually have like now become like multicultural so it's like you know like just people who don't even look the same and they're pro all proliferated from this one man you know and it's it is just being like trying to put myself in his shoes was just like incredibly moving and incredibly like oh my god like to see like to see the family tree like this in person and feel the love and like this love would not exist you know like it's all this gift. love would not exist if not for this man and it's crazy it's, it's very crazy to see that that's beautiful it really is and and it and it was like very moving and psychedelic and reminiscent of an experience i actually had um on my first heroic dose of mushrooms where i felt like i was mm -hmm. seeing the i was like seeing the world tree like i was seeing like oh this is me this is my family this is humanity this you know feeling that kind of energetically or something and, and it was like almost like a microcosm of that experience in those moments um but anyway yeah but wow. but at the same at the same time though if that life's not about something if all of those lives aren't about anything i'm not saying people shouldn't exist for the sake of existing they should but 
I don't, I, I personally don't want to live a rote beige monotonous life that I feel like is underpinned by pointless things. And as you know, I quit my day job recently and Mm -hmm. that's the primary reason It's just like, I don't feel like this shit matters. I just don't feel like it matters me, you know, tinkering around in a command line and making people's technology work for them. Like I, that's not, it doesn't move me. It doesn't inspire me. And it hadn't for a long, long time. So I was just waiting for, for the shoe to drop of getting fired or to be like, this is my fuck it moment. And it was like, yeah. So, and that, and that's where people like you come in, man, because you're, (laughs) you're the people that receive the people in that position. We're like, I'm ready now. Or, or I, you know, I'm, I can't deal with this anymore and I need someone to help guide me. But that's, that's just the, the exterior, you know, yes. I think in my conception, if you work on soul level, what I'm hearing is, yes, you're right. I'm hearing the, 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 this version of view that you identify with that goes through the day to day saying, ah, I'm, I can't anymore. I am mm-hmm. suffocating, I am struggling, I am miserable. But for me, that's just an echo of something much deeper that's actually mm-hmm. saying quite the opposite. It's saying, I want more. Mm-hmm. I want more happy. I want more connection. I want more spirit. I want more. And for me, it's like, okay, how do we talk to that? Now, some of us, we might not. We just need to stay there because that's what's available and that's fine. But I always encourage people to look that underneath those the pain there is something that's actually calling you it's like your spirit disembodied it's like come there is so much more there is so much more this is not what it is Mm -hmm. this is not the freudian you know be a functioning neurotic and that's happiness kind of version of life it's actually a deeper part of you saying you actually telling me that you want more love you want more fulfillment you want more enriching experiences you want more x and reaching experiences might be one thing for you today. Like I worked with a guy who did everything you can imagine. Jumped naked out of an airplane to Burning Man. Did the whole, like, he wasn't happy. Wow. Because happiness changed. He had an event that made him realize, like, wait, actually, true fulfillment for me is finding deep relationships. Hmm. Is having people I can really talk to. Is finding a person that's going to be my partner. And together we're going to explore sexuality and spirituality and connectedness and all that. It changed. Yeah. Right? And to me, I, I think something, one thing that feels important to mention is we can't talk about, you know, soulfulness and all this without talking about the reality of, of trauma. You know, that we're all... <clears throat> and trauma doesn't have to be, you know, I told you before we started recording, it doesn't have to be something really bad that happened to me. It can be, I told you, it took me two days in my retreat to shake off this intense weight of what I would call like capitalistic induced depression. It's like, oh my yeah. God, I'm so heavy. It's so yeah. heavy for me. And I had to really kind of sit with this part of me that's like frantically, manically looking for things to do or because or living in this high wired somatic state of like, oh, my God, I have to do something because, you know, work and this and that. And it's like, shh, nothing, nothing needs to happen. Yeah. You can just be shh. Yeah. And I think a lot of us live in that. So let's we can't. <clears throat> We have to acknowledge, I think that's the complexity. That's what he's talking in personality one and two. It's how do you Mm -hmm. find soul within a reality you can't really alter all alone in the collective. Totally. You know, and I heard something in your last podcast. I don't remember the name of the man, so I don't want to. I think he was saying something about how intrinsically we're all selfish. And that we become or we work in collective in order to create more opportunities. Hmm. And I'm going to advocate for the opposite. <clears throat> and maybe it's because I'm Israeli and I come from a collectivist culture and I have collectivist culture heritages, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But I think we're selfish as a coping mechanism. 
I'm curious who, I think this, we're is, selfish. who this person is now. I don't remember who you're talking about. I either. can tell you if you <laughs> let me. I can look. Uh, Synchronicity soul and the price of progress. Oh, Chris Ryan. Yeah, Chris Ryan. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. And I'm sure it's more complex than that. But I really see hyper individualism as a trauma response. Yeah. And I think he would agree with you. I totally think he would agree with you. Okay. Okay. Um, right. But um, what you know, what you're saying triggered a memory too of something I was talking to my friend Jen about last time. Hmm. Um, we we did a mind meld together, and it was we we started going down the rabbit hole of like megalithic structures and ancient temples, and hmm. how these ancient civilizations were just predominantly they must have been predominantly obsessed with these feats of sacred engineering, right? And if you just look at what happens if that is your central, the heart of your culture, and then everything emanates outward from that versus what we have now, it's pretty clear what the fuck is going on. You know, it's like <laughs> there, there's, it's like- No questions I It's answered. like the sacred is at the center and then everything emanates outward from there. And now instead, it's just creation and wealth for the sake of itself. And if you have like a sacred thing that's like deeply secondary to the main, what you're talking about, this idea of like, no, keep the wheel going, keep the dollars flowing. Keep it going. Keep it going. Don't stop. You're not allowed to stop. You can stop after 50 years or whatever, you know. Um, but if instead everything is held by this overarching sacred thing where probably you could like literally turn and look at, you know, if you lived in ancient Egypt, you could probably turn and there's probably mm -hmm. just a gorgeous temple or pyramid like in your city or whatever that everything is based around. And like this, the, the the psychological difference between these two ways of going through life, I don't think could be deep any deeper. Like there, there's like a deep schism where I think humans, you know, people have. I think they people call us like the the ape that knows that it knows or something. Isn't that what like Homo sapiens sapien right, sapiens right, means right. or the the whatever? But maybe, but I think it's almost just as central to being a human that there's this sacred impulse. You know, like we, I don't think we've ever gone back and, like, from, from, to my knowledge, some of the earliest anthropological discoveries are like cave drawings that clearly have spiritual things happening with like mm -hmm. shamans and like mushrooms and sky beings. And you, you, ancient burial sites there's always some kind of like ritualistic component there's like this has always been with us like our awareness of this has always been with us and it's just but it's slowly eroding it's like every like the where we're living our lives now slowly is eroding that to a point where it almost doesn't exist and no one worships any central symbols anymore no one worships mm. any like at least not on an en masse deep deep level like it's probably like 1% of the population or 10% of the population that are deeply oriented to, toward that thing. And unfortunately, I think a subsection of those people are probably doing it in a very perverted way in that like it's actually exclusionary and damaging and otherizing to the rest of the world in a mm. way that, you know, you don't believe the right thing. So you're fucked. Right. And we consider you to be religious competition. Yeah, right. Right. whatever like pejorative word you know down to like the level of some groups still killing other groups for believing the wrong shit mm. so i think what it's do you think needs to happen then to bring to re bring the scent the sacred to the center again in think, in in modernity right? yeah in our western modernity i think honestly it's as simple as the agreement on a sacred principle hmm. like i don't even I don't even know if it matters as much what we call it, if we call it soul or God or whatever, just that like there's so, like, you know, the, the namaste kind of sentiment of like the, the like real divinity in me recognizes it in you. And that's 
a given. Like that's that's an understood component of the way I operate with another human being before anything else. But the problem is when you don't feel that being reciprocated or you don't think that person's thinking of you in that way, it's going to make you not want to interact so with them on that, that level So that's exactly either. my question. So yeah. how do you do that? How do we, what do we need to reconnect with to do that regardless of a very secular culture that idealizes? I mean, you and I talked about it in one podcast, right? That there is this idealization of all these false gods, right? The cars, the the, the luxury, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. PPFF, pre- power, prestige, fame, and fortune, right? All these false gods. So how do we bring back this thing without it creating another dependency? Well, if you're going to namaste me first, then I'll namaste you. But if you're not going to see the sacred in me, I'm not participating in the game. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the more... I mean, let's at least celebrate the fact that we're on the cusp of millions more people taking mushrooms. Maybe that will help a little bit. But, um, and maybe it will also fuck some things up. But probably both. (laughs) Yeah, I think both. A little bit of both. Yeah. Uh, Usually that is the answer. Whatever, whatever two possibilities you're thinking of, it's like, oh, it's going to be both. It's, it's going to be both. Yeah. But, um, I think you have to be courageous enough as an individual to always lead with that, to just always lead with the sort of like, and and this is going to sound ridiculously cheesy, but sometimes I go into a room and I, I think of myself like as of like, I'm witnessing myself and other people. And sometimes that really emotionally moves me. If I'm in the mm-hmm. right mood, you know, if like, usually it's like, if I go on like a longer ish walk to, there's like a coffee shop, like a mile from my house. And if all the things are just lined up, right. Like I have the right amount of caffeine in me. It's the weather's <laughs> nice. I'm in a decent mood. And then I walk in and like, people are just being nice and you know, smiling. There's this part deep down inside of me. That's just like, you feel like a, like almost like a mystical kinship with everyone. And then that makes it easy to behave in that way. Mm-hmm. But when you're not feeling that way and you're, and you feel isolated and depressed and dreary and like nothing's going your way, that's a hard space to occupy. So <laughs> I think it's like mm. the battle, the battle to try to orient yourself toward that, yes. that connection, soul, divinity, abundance, whatever you want to call it, and and just mm. try, almost like train yourself to occupy that space. And if you want to even look at it from like a purely empirical, practical level, I mean, we know positive psychology works. We know right. focusing on gratitude, focusing on the things you have rather than the things you don't have has measurably positive effects on your mental health. So there's that element of it too. I love it. And yeah, I took a psycho- a positive psychology course. And I remember the first um, exercise they had us do is that they asked us to keep a small journal and every day for five minutes to pause and find something that moves us. And what he was then trying to, and he was this wonderful man who was just, seemed like he's beaming light out of every orifice at every single moment. It was ridiculous. Um, but he was, you know, if he what the exercise was about was it's not about pushing away the shadow. It's mm. about developing perception. That's right? a great So way thinking to about, right? So it's about developing perception. It's developing I love I, mean, I love how you're practicing it. I think about myself and I'm like, well, how do I do this? I'm like, well, I'm, I think it's for me, it's just honesty. Like I've had enough experiences to know that I have this very spiritual part of myself, soulful part of myself, that if I really kind of clean myself enough, I can come from that. And I have enough self-honesty to know that sometimes I'm bitter and I'm neurotic and I'm just in my own misery. And I just like in one, I like, yeah. I just mm-hmm. want to complain and, and, but I'm honest about all of it. 
So then I have yeah. choice. Yeah. Then I can try and choose to be like, okay, well, I'll feel miserable, but I'm going to this event and I want to show up in this way. Can I clean out whatever yeah. I can clean out to reconnect with that? And I think honesty for me, yeah, I think it's just one way of like, don't push away anything, right? If you want to bring the state, we can't event. It's not going to help if we put a huge like phallus of gold in the middle of San Francisco and be like, that's it, Ooh. sacredness. We're just going to write all these like beautiful slogans on it and you can only walk in it and put flowers. That's Dang, not going to do big, anything. a big golden phallus with, with uh, affirmations on it. I'm down for this. I'm down. We for already this. we already have one. It's called the Salesforce Tower. Oh yeah, so. yeah, that's right. <laughs> I mean, if it was a little more penile, though, it would be, and, and it had affirmations all over it. <laughs> you know what? It'd maybe now that I'm saying this, maybe that would make a difference if you walk through this huge thing that has all these positive affirmations. But anyway, the point being, right? We're, it's not going to solve the homelessness. It's not going to solve poverty. No. Right. It's how do we be stay honest? And, you know, keep practicing the sacred, prioritizing the sacred, which yeah. is what I love about what you're bringing. Yeah. And, and I almost think that that in and of itself is enough because I feel like people know, like, I'm the type of person where if you ask me if I believe this or don't believe that, I'm going to always be like, well, what do you mean by this? Right. You know, like, do you believe in God? What do you mean by God? Do you believe yep. in whatever? What do you mean by that? And I don't think we need to get that philosophical with this idea. I think mm. I think in general, people know what I'm saying. People know what you're saying. People know this feeling within themselves. And if we can prioritize that feeling, if we can choose, like we were saying, okay, macrocosm microcosm sort of exercise we don't have the outward architecture anymore of a sacred monument in the center of a city that everyone respects but what if we orient our inner architecture that way you know what if we mm -hmm. build the fucking internal temple and try as hard as we can to let everything emanate from there and i think that's probably the best we can do in a hero's journey sort of modern way where it's all incumbent upon the individual now, unfortunately, like it's all incumbent upon you and me and each person listening to like do the work, visit the silence, do the kind deed, spend more time on the things they know they need to spend time on and less time. It's like, it's all within our power. It's, it really is. And it is. That, that's one of those things where it's like, it's kind of refreshing to just lay the, it's weird because there's kind of burden that we've been talking about that I think is really harmful, but then there's like a powerful burden too, where it's like mm -hmm. the empowering burden is it's like, no, you have the ability to change your yes. life for the better. You yes. have the ability to make yourself feel better. You have the ability to make other people feel better. Mm -hmm. So it's like that. I just don't think we spend enough time acknowledging that you know oh i love totally because you have to go through the first layer of burden right you have to go through that first layer of like oh i don't want to think about this and oh why you know it's like one of my paid pe pet peeve statements it's like when people tell me like oh why do you dig so deep or why why you it's like what do you mean like how are you going to get to gold if you're not digging deep enough in the earth like yeah. how are you going to get to like um Right, but underneath, I love that idea of like positive burden. Right, it's like, no, oh, here's your potential colleague. You, what you just said, here's this, here's your possibilities. You're actually possible. You're possible of launching that podcast. You're possible of launching that thing. You're possible of changing your, changing your career to something that feels it's in your hands, and it is. It comes with a price. You have to, and you have to take the toll of that burden. Um. Yeah, it just makes the word burden feel all so different all of a sudden. It's like, oh, yeah, I want that burden. Yeah. I want to yeah, experience like, that thing that's like yeah. calling me to become something that I want to become. Yeah. Yeah. The Which burden makes is... me think about psychedelics. And oh, I'm curious yeah. I'm curious how, um, how do you think that's going to change things? 
Because you're psychedelic by mind. You're psychedelic Mm -hmm. by nature, I think. I think I am too. I think I think in the experiences I've had, my mind has always been pulled deeply into that mind realm. You know, I mean, even like we were saying before, we were joking around about astrology at the beginning. Like people tell me that's what I am because I'm a Pisces and I have all these other things that are sort of supposedly stacked in that way. So that's mm-hmm. just the way that I'm pulled. Structured. Right. But I do I do think that these things for sure offer a portal into that realm of deeper feeling, of deeper meaning, of deeper purpose. And like I also said, I think that it can go either way for sure. I think it can yield bigger ego. I think it can my cat is like bashing at the door right now. <laughs> Damn. So give me one second. I was looking under the door and she was just like her little paws under the door. And she's like, oh. yeah, she, she's <laughs> let a, me in. She's a trip. Um, but anyway, she, so I, I do, I do think that it's going to yield in both directions. Like I won't launch into the whole mana personality thing again of you, you encounter some huge, what almost presence of, divinity in these spaces and then you come out of it thinking you're the special one i am chosen this thing came to me and told me i'm the whatever there's a lot of danger for that too but i also um again to to regurgitate something i said in another pod recently if you if you put the button in front of me and said do you do you push the widespread psychedelic gnosis button or do you not push it it's a binary option. I'd be like, push it. Push it. You push it. Oh yeah. I mean oh, yeah. we 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 need something, man. Like we're we're in the deepest meaning crisis, mental health crisis I, I think civilization's oh, ever been ever in. known. And it's not going to get better unless something drastic changes. Yeah. And I can't say what's going to happen to each and every individual who consumes these molecules. But I can tell you where I think it's going to make the wind blow. I can like tell you a general direction, and it's more soulful. It's more meaningful. It's more mysterious. It's more interconnected, and I think that's a lot better than nothing. You know, I agree with you. I've said it's either psychedelics or aliens. <laughs> Careful, both. That's a both option again. I, I'm, I'm. T- you know what? If there's a if a spaceship is going to land in San Francisco tomorrow. Maybe if I'm under some influence, it might make it the experience. I don't know. Maybe make it easier for us to communicate or something. I don't know. Well, but I'm well, with maybe. you that we we need a shock. We need a shock yeah. to the humans. You know, the human n- neuron system. <laughs> yeah, that that composes the the collective in order to create something. Yeah, we do. We absolutely do. Maybe a fun mm-hmm. thing to end it on. Is speaking of aliens, what do you think about the idea of sort of consciousness aliens and this this notion that when you take a heroic dose and you feel like you're encountering entities, there are people who very much take seriously the idea that these are actual entities, that these aren't just like Mm -hmm. parts of your brain, parts of your psyche, whatever, that you're actually contacting what could be called aliens. I mean, do you, do you know of Andrew Gallimore? I don't think so, no. Oh, he, he's a very interesting cat. So he's a uh, psychopharmacologist, I believe. Um, PhD, like wor- works in, uh, he does something analytical with, I think pharmaceuticals, but um, he wrote a book called Alien Information Theory. And he believes that like the DMT realm is potentially a mappable dimension that we can like learn the language of and maybe the construction of. Um, and he's actively working, I think, with Strassman on trying to do like he's not executing the studies, but I believe he is he helped in creating or conceiving of the technology to keep people under the influence of DMT like indefinitely 
so they could like be on a constant DMT infusion for like hours and hours and hours. Um, and I believe they are doing this. They or they have done this already in uh, like a supervised settings, and there will be a study coming out or something. But um, but yeah, so that Ooh. that's what that's what he thinks is that these are these are beings. These aren't just. You know, I, I always hesitate to use the word just because I don't mean to reduce it, even if it is a mental phenomenon um, strictly. It doesn't rob it of any potency, but it definitely does make a difference if it's if it's like an actual entity versus not being an entity. What, mm-hmm. Have you have you a have you had experiences like that? Yes. And B, what what are your thoughts? I did. I did have an experience like that on ayahuasca i have to on uh, mine was singular and i've mm. done a lot of experiences but i did have an experience of visiting what i would you know call like one of those crystalline palaces and seeing seeing an entity that um i think you would appreciate that was very trickstery because it kept shifting its face yes 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 it wouldn't let me capture its true form so it kept like shifting um and it all felt, I, I, do I believe that there are alien life forms? Of course there are. It's not a question. Um, I don't think we need to go too far. Um, there is enough experiences that people have come back with. There is enough similarities and experiences across different cultures. Right, so even cultures before there was internet, before we could communicate between continents, that describe very similar things. Right, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah. I, I if think it's, it's the tapping into the collective unconscious and its mythopoetic language. Maybe if it's, um, but in the context of psychedelics, I I think that it's interesting. I love this research. I'm going to look into it, but. I think that DMT is probably the biggest key we have to, right? Have our, if you believe in that, is to untether our consciousness from our physical, yeah. like you call it, the, the protein suit, and <laughs> yeah. let it travel, just like we do when we dream, by the way, right? From certain yeah. traditions, let it travel. And if, and apparently, DMT allows you to travel far enough to potentially see into these other dimensions, which is also like, I mean, we don't need to go, shamanic traditions have done this for thousands of years. Yeah. Right? Ayahuasca came on a serpent that came from space. And on that serpent, there was a, a canoe and there was two people, like two plants inside the canoe and that's ayahuasca. Like, where did that story come from? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's DMT in ayahuasca. How did is that a someone's vision or is that like a tribe that was like, oh my god, look, here's the origin story of this of this brew. I think it's like ridiculous to to in some way. My belief is if if you can imagine it, it's real. If you can mm-hmm. see it in your mind's eye, it's real. Right, I think I mentioned this to you. There is this beautiful story of Jung that Marie Louise von Franz talks that when she was interning with him, she had this schizophrenic patient who said, "I, that she every night goes to the moon, and has these experiences on the moon." And she came to Jung and she was like, "Listen, this obviously this person is very schizophrenic. Like, um, he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's not as though she's going to the moon." She is going to the moon. And you are to work with it as though she, because he truly believed in that psychic phenomenon. He didn't see schizophrenic as just like, oh, she's totally detached from reality. She's like, no, she's able to go inside her psyche to connect to something that is beyond the neurotic. So she goes to the moon and she's having experiences in the moon that she still didn't. His thing, that, as I understand, is like she just haven't figured out how to integrate it. That's why she's so schizophrenic. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I, which is similar I, I feel, to psychedelics. You go have these yes, big experiences. Right. It's the right. failure in integration that creates the distress afterwards. Yeah. Right. That creates the depression, the anxiety, the, the, 
dissociation, the, the depersonalization, whatever it is. It is funny because now we've gotten to a place where having an experience on a psychedelic is less taboo than an endogenously created experience that we would now call a mental health disorder. Like now, yes. now, now that's like the final taboo <laughs> of like, if your own brain is doing it, it means there's something wrong, quote unquote, with you now. And, and mm -hmm. practically, no, I, I don't want to have uncontrolled bouts of experiences that don't make sense with consensus reality. I don't want to be super paranoid going through. I, I don't want those things. However, to your point and to Young's point, the idea that we should diminish them and try to convince the person that this is not real does not seem like the way to help the person make sense of it. Because even if it's not real, which it's probably not real in the concretized sense, but it doesn't mean it doesn't mean something. It doesn't mean there's not something important there, you know, and in, in many, and maybe, maybe I'm romanticizing it. Maybe if I like knew more schizophrenics, I'd be like, this is just ugly. It's not good. Like you need to medicate these people. I, I may, may think that, but sitting here now talking to you, my mythopoetic friend with my own mythopoetic <laughs> heart deeply agrees with that. That, that I think there's probably a gem of wisdom somewhere in there that needs to be made sense of. And we definitely don't. Well, you can speak no. to it more, more than I can. But no, and I love like what you said, that, that it's, it's we are progressing towards dismissing natural phenomena, right? So I think maybe a more digestible thing of it, and maybe we can end on that, is like intuition. Right. Right. When someone is like, hey, Michael, I had this intuition about you that you're like suffering. Is everything okay? Like I saw it in a dream. I saw you crying in a dream. And it hits you so deep that you'll be like, oh, no, that what are you talking about? That's not true. What happens if we actually, instead of denying it so fast, just became really curious about each other's phenomena? Yeah. Yeah. Right? That's how in old times they found like young Buddhas or like reincarnated Buddhas and reincarnated shamans. They're like, these kids would show, right? It's like that room in the Matrix where every all these kids are sitting and like bending spoons and making things fly. Oh, yeah. And, like, yeah. Right? And so what, what happens if as a culture we started like just being more curious about well, maybe it's true. And obviously I'm not talking like, okay, everybody's like has the capacity to communicate with aliens in the waking state or something. It's not about that. But it's about like why the why are we so hell bent on denying each other's reality? Right. When it becomes uncomfortable for us to believe it. Ooh, yeah. That is <laughs> a heavy oh, it's and, wonderful. And, and, and fascinating thought to to wrap us up on, man. This has been such a great one. It's flowed mm -hmm. seamlessly. I really feel like we've we've dipped into some delicious sauces with our collective wonder nuggets on this one the soup um, definitely feels tasty and, and are you a, are really you a good. soup guy are you into soup yes i'm very into soup i'm very into oh, soup. Yeah. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let i'm gonna let this drop on the podcast <laughs> me and a couple of close friends have toyed with the idea of starting uh like a kind of a joke social media page called broth boys and it's all just <laughs> centered centered around like delicious broths and you know, just like rich ramens and creamy. But you should just put stuff. it in like wrap it in very masculine like presentations. Yeah, yeah Andrew Tate boy. will Andrew Tate will be holding all the soups. <laughs> 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 always, always a pleasure. Always yeah, a pleasure. Man. I love you. What, what, love you. What do you have going? What do you have going on? Any anything you want to tell people about? Um. Yeah, if you want to follow us on the, the Integration Circle or me, Doctor Ido Cohen. Um, I told you we're doing a study on couples who are using psychedelics to improve their relationship or develop psychospiritually. If there's any couples out there who have who want to share their experience, you can go to the Integration Circle Instagram. There's a form there they can fill out. Um, and we interview them. I think it's going to be a beautiful study. We already have like beautiful experiences. I shared some with you, interviews that we had. Um, yeah, other than that, just to stay in touch. This is how communities form. Love it, man. Love it. 
Thanks for doing it.